Hello, welcome to Citizens Forum. It is Monday, December the 3rd. I'd like to start by thanking the volunteer crew and the Shaw staff that makes this program happen every couple of weeks. My first guest is Isadora Godchild. We're going to be talking about housing in this province. And for many, 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 many people, it's a disaster. But for some people, it's... Uh, are making huge fortunes out of it Absolutely. and a lot of people have done a little bit good as well yes yes well I thought I would go to this article that was sent to me on the it's uh, on the restrictions on rent hikes and it what what the um, what the headline in it says vacancy control could be the death knell for 12,000 new rental units and that's a survey and the rental developers say linking rent control to units rather than tenants would put most new projects at risk and put existing homes and buildings into despair. So in other words, they don't want this. And what, what, um, what it well, actually... Maybe we should just say exactly what it is. Okay, yes. So what it is... Now, it right now, if somebody is living there, the rent can only be increased 2.5% a year. That's correct. But correct. if those people move out... They can gouge for the next tenants right, that come right. in. And Now, what I don't understand is why this can't be done in a sensible way, that it's controlled. You know, That's that right. if you're doing something, mm -hmm. then okay. But if there's no need to do anything, then mm -hmm. there's no need to do anything, and you shouldn't be able to raise the rents unless you're losing mm -hmm. money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're not losing money, let's see how much you're making. And if you're making a fair amount, then mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. I don't see why... Well, it's a big, huge, um, what is it? They make huge amounts of money when people, so was, take for example, last, uh, the last show I was on, this, you know, w when we were talking about rent evictions and demolitions of the existing housing, where uh, tenants were paying 750 or whatever, but when they moved out, they were gonna, the rents were gonna be like $1,500. Like that should not be allowed, those types of gouging, uh, renters for uh, that amounts of money. So what they're what they're looking at is trying to put some kind of control on it. But the um, but then they say the um, then they the, they say the twelve thousand new units under development would be at risk of cancellation of this um, vacancy control mechanism. Were in, was implemented, which is this is according to the Urban Development Institute. And the Urban and Development Institute is the kind of the corporate spokesperson the for, correct, for correct, the development Correct, correct, yeah, yeah, they're on their side yeah. and they're, they're, they're um, lobbying, <coughs> if you will, for them and the, um, the developers don't want this to happen because, and they're saying, you know, well, if we don't get all, you know, this money, then, you know, we, you know the, the, the buildings could go in disrepair and the blah, 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 and could put the kibosh in building houses because nobody wants to invest in it and so on and so forth. But really that's not the case because they're still making all kinds of money on the rents that are, you know, they're getting, right? So what are they doing with that? You know, that's supposed to be going into, I mean, every month, f apartment block of, say, um, 500 tenants or whatever is quite a substantial amount of money every single solitary month. So this gouging stuff that they're against is, is, uh, is just that. It's gouging, and, and they want to be able to have the right to do that. And that's what their argument is. And that's and the developers, I guess. That's the, the developers. The owners of... That's right. And so by them saying, you know, I mean, so what was it? Um, oh, yeah. So however, currently landlords may raise the rent by however much they wish between rental leases, which has prompted calls for a vacancy control system tying rental increase caps to the unit. So... I mean, that makes sense. Well, of course it makes sense, but not to the developers that Or whoever it is that... Yeah, uh, well, it makes sense because the thing is, is at this, at the present time, they're allowed to, to jack up the rents in any amount they want. And so, therefore, if you have, you know, one day you've got an affordable unit, next day you can't, you're 
owned on yeah. the street. And you know what's <laughs> even worse is that that is an incentive to underbuild mm -hmm. rentals. Mm -hmm. Because as long as you underbuild, which is what they've done for years, mm -hmm. quite deliberately, as long as you underbuild and there's a shortage mm -hmm. of something as important as housing, mm -hmm. then people are going to have to pay what you ask, well, you as the it. industry. Well, yeah. And they've done it over a period of 20 years. They pushed, not the, they own the government, so they mm -hmm. got the government out of the industry because mm -hmm. the government used to build many, many thousands yeah, of units absolutely, every year absolutely. right across Canada. And that was central mortgage and housing. They, that was their mandate. That was, that was the, the uh, department that was responsible of making sure there was social housing for everybody. Yeah, so there's enough. You and know. if there's no shortage, prices don't go yeah. crazy. But if you can create a shortage and you're running the show, mm -hmm. imagine the immense amounts of money. Oh, absolutely. You're make. Absolutely. And they've done it to us. Well, that's it. And um, the thing is, is that um, the government, if, if they had been really interested in uh, you know, affordable housing for people, they would have been looking at all these these apartment blocks that were coming up for sale and bought them up and kept it at affordable housing. But with these, with these what I call behemoth, uh, you know, develop, um, real estate developers that are buying, gobbling up all these apartment blocks everywhere, right? And then, they're, and then they, like I said, put a little paint, you know, put a little fix at this and fix at that. Next thing you know, it's twice the amount they were before. And then boom, out, out these people have to go because they can't afford to pay from $750 a month to $1,500 all of a sudden, probably plus utilities, you know, so. There's a building in my neighborhood um, it's been advertising units, actually it's two buildings, mm -hmm. eight to ten stories. They've been advertising units for, I think, seven or eight months. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I phoned just to see. Mm -hmm. uh, a bachelor is going for, I think it was close to 1400 a little <laughs> bit over, a little bit under. But they sit empty. They've been it's empty for months and months and months. But they, you know, it's crazy. It just is, crazy. yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, a bachelor, that's like, what, one room for $1,400? You need five people to pay that rent. And you mentioned the number when you said Behemoth, this company, yes. uh, Blackstone Yes, yes, Properties. and let's go to that. Let's, yeah. Um, this, um, this Blackstone, Bla I think it's called Blackstone, um, uh, pr Property Partners. They're, uh, they're out of America, uh, and they're literally this really behemoth. They have like a $120 billion investment capital in real estate portfolio, which includes hotels, mm -hmm. office, rental, industrial, residential properties in USA, Europe, Asia, Latin America, and now it's, uh, as I mentioned in the previous um, show that we did, they've amalgamated it with uh, Starlight, which is another behemoth in, in Canadian standards, real estate investment business. So they've amalgamated, so this American Blackstone company has amalgamated with Starlight, so now it's like double the behemoth, and they're <laughs> buying up you know, buildings left, right, and center, and and the and the kind of the, the shady side of this Blackstone uh, company was back in 2008 during the financial crisis, which was intentional. The intentional intentional financial crisis in 2008. Then a lot of the housing the hub, housing bubble burst, and there a lot of foreclosures. And this behemoth Blackstone part property partners um, swooped in, pounced on, and gobbled up <laughs> as much of the swath of building of, of apartments and housing and stuff as they could possibly get their hands on. So, so that's like, and now basically, in my view, they've slithered their way into Canada. And so now they're partners with this Starlight um, uh, thing who bought up these four um, apartment blocks in James Bay. And that's what we, we were talking about where that uh, tenant, you know, was, uh, or the various tenants, they were paying decent, affordable rents as far as they could. And um, 
and now they will be either renovated or the places will be de demolished and they'll be built up. Now with all these buildings that had been coming up for um, uh, for sale, the the government could have bought could have came in and bought those. I mean they weren't. They weren't expensive, so the amount they're trying to put in for building would be a fraction of the cost if they had kept and bought those apartments, which exist now, and kept the people right. in their places. Right, 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 you know, right, right. but you know, I mean, in in a way where you know, right. like um, the uh, I see kind of the the political uh, world, if you will, is like a um, like. You know, they're, in a way, they're like lunatics. <laughs> because lunatics? <laughs> lunatics, yeah. Yeah, really? Because they don't do anything. Well, they do do anything. They do exactly what you said. They, they allow it to happen. Yes, yes, they, they, that's they right. They work for these very yes. people. We think our governments work for us. That's no. our number no, one no, mistake. No. Who even now even thinks no. that? After what thirty a lot, years? Yeah, a lot of people do. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people, you know, people. Yeah, right. I did what's for that? most of my life. W what's well, I kind of the kind of veil fell for me about thirty years ago, yeah. thirty-five yeah. years yeah. ago, you know, because yeah. I could see, you know, it was uh, especially when they started uh, cutting off, uh, you know, the no more social. Health. I mean, I was on the forefront of trying to prevent this in the Gulf Islands, right? Because I could see where it was going. So I was up there, I was at the meetings and I was talking about it and everything and you know, it was like deaf, dumb and blind, right, kind of a thing because they started um, wiping out all the affordable houses that, that existed already. And then they're up there, oh, we're really concerned about affordable housing. I was like furious. <laughs> So I just kind of, you no, know. These people know what they're doing. They well, run our country. They, they own they the do. media. Yeah. They, yeah. For example, CFAX. Yeah. For months now, they've, they've been just, especially mm -hmm. on their morning show, really mm -hmm. attacking homeless people. Oh, and really like spreading a, a lot of negative feeling yeah. in the community over that issue. People, but never once have I heard them talk about this issue. No. About, about the buying up of our homes and I the solution, know. which is the government could buy them and. That's right. You know, and keep but them But instead, in we're building Site C. Oh, my God. <laughs> don't get this. Don't me. even go there with me. I am just absolutely furious about that. Billions and billions of going down the drain. Anyways, don't get me started. But that's what our governments <laughs> know. do, right? Because they don't work for us. And that's if we right. can't. If we can't get democracy into this province, mm -hmm. I mean, we can see what they're doing. We live in a corporate dictatorship. Well, I voted for proportional representation. Me too. <laughs> Yay! Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll be very interesting when this uh, when this is airing. Uh, today's the third, yeah. so the cutoff date is in yeah. a few days, and this will start in a week or so. Yeah, so yeah. we may so be close to. Hopefully. I hope. Hopefully, yeah. I yeah. hope that the numbers. Mm -hmm. are completely transparent. Yes, absolutely. People have got to be able to go in there after all the counting is mm -hmm, done mm -hmm. and and do a recount mm -hmm. and make sure that if it says mm -hmm. 50 votes here mm -hmm. that that's counted right and that's when the right, number is exactly, when the number is transposed yeah. somewhere else it's yeah, still 50 yeah. and it's 50 and it's not 450 mm -hmm. because right. these things are doable. That's right. And Mm -hmm. And we're out of time. Okay. But I just, yeah. you know, a yeah. fair and transparent count Absolutely. is important. Absolutely. Isadora, thank you very much. Thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. And thank you for watching this segment of Citizen Forum. And I'll just say that we live in the second biggest country in the world with a population of only 35 million people. And yet they tell us we've got to have, have, to have a shortage of housing. <laughs> it is absolutely crazy. Thanks for okay. watching this yeah. segment of Citizens Forum. <laughs>
to me, it just showed, I didn't, at the time, I completely believed the official story that it was Lee Harvey Oswald, and I, you know, I believed it for decades. But now, I see the real power that's out there, and, um, you know, I just don't believe the official story anymore about anything. So, Bo, the... Well, uh, firstly, he was killed on the 22nd, not the 23rd, how, November. Um, but what's interesting today now is that last night on 60 Minutes, they gave a, a, an a eulogy for the recent deceased President George H.W. Bush. And they didn't mention any of the chicanery that he was involved with uh, before he was president and uh, leading up his family history with international banking, the defense uh, establishment cartels, interlinking uh, directorships and how his family moved in and out of all of that. And he was actually in Dallas uh, on November 22nd, 1963. And 60 Minutes didn't mention anything of any of that stuff. And there's lots of pictures of him there. Uh, he actually made a phone call an hour and 15 minutes after the assassination um, to the FBI. And uh, then there was a memo by um, J. Edgar Hoover, which was about him. So he was there, but he's one of like several people didn't know where they were on, nine, on, on, uh, on that day of the assassination, but yet he was there working and he was staying at the Sheraton Hotel. And several of the pictures... He was uh, later the head of the CIA. Later head of the CIA, yes. At this point he was uh, the, the head of the, um, uh, the, the, the wild Cubans, they like to call them, uh, that involved uh, people like E. Howard Hunt, who actually confessed in a unrelated trial of the JFK assassination that he was actually the bag man in Dallas that day and uh, because he had a kind of a loose mouth and sometimes you could get him going and he'd start spilling the beans on all kinds of things and uh, the people in the courtroom were just absolutely astounded. They were shocked. Mark Lane, the attorney, tells the story of how it developed but he said basically he was the bag man, and that's a, the term they use for someone who hands out guns and money, payroll, to the people who are involved in the operation. And the several pictures of George H.W. Uh, Bush uh, around the scene of Dealey Plaza, one of them, I, I used to say, well, those are too far away. They, they could be anybody, you know. But then you, you get more and more of them, and some of them are getting up really close, and then the ones that are far away start to look much more like, oh yeah, that does look like him. Wasn't he meeting with someone from the Bin Laden family on the day of 9-11? Was there...? Uh, uh, yes, that was, yeah, part of the Bin Laden, him and uh, James Baker, um, they were doing um, uh, some sort of a business yeah. deal the day before, and as we know now that the Bin Laden family was the only people that were allowed to fly away after 9-11. So, and uh, it, all the other planes were grounded that day. So we're talking about right now the death of President... Uh, John F. Kennedy. And, and the death of President Bush as well. And he, you, you mentioned that um, while we were talking earlier that Bush... Um, was responsible for the attack on Grenada when he was president. Uh, yes, yet there was absolutely no reason to invade Grenada. Um, a lot there of wasn't. Why did they do it? It's a tiny little country. Yeah. Thousands of people were killed, uh, burned alive in the ghettos. Um, in, some insiders think that was, it was Bush just trying to get a name for himself as a as a real man, a leader of a of a hard forced uh, American empire, and you have to understand that this American bullying, uh, you know, officially, more or less, uh, came out in 1813 already with the Monroe President Monroe Doctrine, which states that no one in the world is allowed to come over here to the American countries because. This is our backyard now. This is going to be our kingdom, 
and everybody's going to take orders from us. And of course, in Canada here, we like to think we're independent, but we do uh, listen and pretty much follow as a colony. Uh, like, for example, when it was time to um, bomb Latvia, well, what did Latvia do to Canada, right? It, nothing. So it's a NATO thing of which we're pressured into becoming a part of. All colonies of the U.S. are in NATO, and other countries are, of course. Do you mean Serbia friendly. a few years back? Or? Serbia, of course, they attacked Serbia, too, as well. Latvia, Yugoslavia. Canada attacked Latvia? Well, no. Uh, well, one, one of the generals, you go back a couple of years, a Canadian general is saying our bombing program in Latvia is going well. Well, what is the bombing program supposed to do? Well, it's supposed to kill people, you know, in the masses. Well, it turns out what was wrong with Latvia, well, they weren't taking orders well from NATO, the U.S. particularly, which is the head of this mafia organization, basically. And therefore, they needed to soften them up so that they would become more conducive to allowing the U.S. to put missiles pointed at Russia on its front door. So, you know, this it's very is, deep. This is so different than what we're always told about what's going on. I mean, it is, I mean, I'm, I'm with you in, in, in what you're saying, but the official story is, I mean, it just shows the power of this force. It's, it's the corporations and the government and the media all together to completely create this story of, and we all live in it. You know? Yeah, it is. Our, I, I've heard people actually tell me it's, it's my reality. And <clears throat> television is a reality. And, and of course, uh, the head of Fox News some years ago uh, said that, you know, we've got it made. We just put out what we want people to believe and accept it because he said they're la the public is lazy and they want us to give them a narrative and uh, they accept it. Well, uh, Rather so we than do lazy, the I'd, say, I'd say trusting. I mean, thinking back, thinking back in my own life, you you grow up in it, you believe it, you trust it. I mean, I certainly always believed the people who read the news on CBC and CTV and Global and listened to the radio and read the newspapers. I believed all of it, well, and it then you find out that it's all kind of a pack of lies, and well, it's, it's just control. When you you know the um, Bush again around 1990, you remember him announcing, now we can see coming into view a new world order. Well, it actually wasn't coming into view. They'd been planning it for years. In fact, we could take it back to the Monroe Doctrine if we wanted to, but if we went just to 1904, there became a new plan with the British economists, and they started looking towards Eurasia. Oh, well, now's our chance to maybe take over the world so the forces of money and power, plutocracy, were more and more galvanizing to see this new world order. And so when Bush is announcing it in around 1990 or 1991, we're actually seeing what we now call the unipolar world, which I say in my terminology is based on the uniperspective. The uniperspective is driving the unipolar world. And the unit perspectives can be put down into four words, and this is what we see so beautifully in the media constantly. Every day we're inoculated with, you can put it into four words, evil east, angelic west. And as long as news people write under that umbrella and don't go outside of that, they keep their jobs and have a nice career. And the ones who go outside that and question and challenge, well, maybe we're not so angelic. Maybe they're not quite so evil. Well, now that shows a, puts a question mark into the minds of people. And you want them to go to bed at night very secure in their sensation that we are the good people and we'd never hurt anybody unless it was an accident. So a little collateral damage once in a while maybe, a mistake once in a while, but not outside of evil east angelic west so, so i'll just throw something in here if sure. people want to google uh, bush hitler and guardian you will see the story in the guardian newspaper of how the father prescott bush the father and grandfather of the two presidents uh, was involved in a bank that was funneling money from corporate america and wealthy america 
to Adolf Hitler and the Nazis in the 1920s and 1930s to get them started, right? So if this is true, and there's no question about it, this is historic fact, this is not conjecture or conspiracy, this is fact that they were doing this, then what does it mean about our whole history of what we think we know when we don't even know that, that they funded Hitler to bring him to power? Well, it's, it's, uh, we're absolutely saturated in this fantastic, you can only call it a Disneyland fantasy world. I mean, you take, uh, all these people are associated. Uh, Henry Ford was associated. He was a buddy of Hitler's. His engines were in Hitler's army trucks and in his tanks that were killing Canadians and Americans left and right. And you'll never see that on the advertisements. You'll never see it in the news that, you know, Ford Motor Company is beautiful. The Bush family, they're all wonderful people. The bankers that are involved are all, but it goes back to the, uh, the British banking, uh, European banking, and the, the royal families. And it boils down to, if you get to the top, very top of the, the head, you'll see, you'll see um, well, one recent report said that eight families control 50% of the world's wealth. And those families that they're describing are really at the top of the banking empire, the global banking empire. And when you have that kind of money, you really call the shots. You can buy off politicians and, you It's know, not even buy off politicians. You control the entire political system. Yes, so anybody yes. who wants to become a politician with a piece. career <laughs> That's right. has to bow down to you to begin with or there is no way up for them. The whole thing, the media, the political system, I think it's all just a pack of lies that we've been sold. Well, and the media, there was a quote from an American, uh, 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 I think, Supreme Court Justice, the only safe place for democracy, the only safe repository for democracy is in the hands of the people. And we've lost it. We have to get it back. Well, the, yes, and the, the challenge is to the people. and. It's quite frightening now because I hear people telling me that they, uh, they can't be fooled by the media. They know what's going on. So then I ask them, well, who are, who are, who are the enemies? Who, are we, who should we go get? And they repeat every time exactly the same people that the media is saying. We've got to get Russia. We've got to get China. Uh, Osama bin Laden, uh, no court trial on him. No court trial on Lee Harvey Oswald that Bush is involved with. Texas owes us a trial on Lee Harvey Oswald in absentia. Whenever there's a murder, there has to be a trial before you convict somebody of the murder. 9-11, Osama bin Laden was not convicted. The state of New York owes us a trial of Osama bin Laden in absentia. They've got, if they've got the facts, they'll bring them forward. You have to convict him on the facts, and of course there aren't any. And just to show people how crazy things are, in, uh, in New York, uh, a group called Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, which is a group of about 2,500 mm -hmm. architects and engineers who say the official story is impossible because the mm -hmm. planes did not bring down the buildings, That's they were right. brought down yeah. by explosives, are trying to get a grand jury to look into the issue. That's right. 2,500 architects and engineers, is there a word in the media? No, it's all Trump, Russia, it's crazy. Right. So we're caught up in this insanity. I don't know how we're going to get out of it, but we'd better both thank you very much. We're out of time. <laughs> You're welcome. And thank you for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Hello and welcome to Citizens Forum. We're recording on Monday, December 3rd, 2018. And I'd like to thank the volunteers and the Shaw staff for helping us put this production together every other week. Today my guest is Rochelle Hill, and she is a facilitator for a healing modality known as Family Constellations. And I started participating in Family Constellations when I first moved uh, into Victoria, I, when I first started coming to Victoria, before I had actually even started to uh, make the decision that I was going to live here. And I met a, a woman named Jan Hull, and she facilitates family constellations, and my wife and I started going to them to resolve some of the questions and problems that we had in our, in our lives, in our relationships, and we really liked these 
uh, this modality because it seems to work very quickly and it seems to address root or ca root causes ra and family issues rather than just something that's superficial. So I'd like to introduce Rochelle Hill and she's a facilitator right here in Victoria and she trained with Jan and she's uh, going to tell us how she got involved and also just the, the story of family, con the basic story of family constellations. So welcome to the show, Rochelle. Thank you for coming in on such short notice. Great. Thank you for inviting me. It's lovely. So could you, do you want to tell us uh, a little bit about how you got involved with family constellations? Sure. Yeah, sure. Um, it's about six years ago, I went up island to witness the circle of one of Jan, my teacher, uh, her circles up in Nanaimo. And it was there uh, that I was blown away by this work. Um, the healing that I witnessed and participated in in that circle was um, something I've never experienced before. And so on my way back after that experience, I knew I wanted to get involved in this work. And so that when the opportunity came to do training with Jan, I jumped on it. And unbeknownst to me, I'm now actively facilitating circles and doing one-on-one -on -one work with this modality. So you've been doing it for a couple of years now? Yeah, a couple of years, and I've continued doing some advanced training with different facilitators as well. Um, some, uh, we've done nature constellations and mm. different types of uh, organizational constellations. So it's not limited to just family systemic constellations. There's, um, there's so much more reach that you can do in this field. Oh, I didn't even know about that. So tell us a little yeah. bit about how what is the history of family constellations? Because the first thing you think of when you hear a constellation is usually the stars, right? Yes, so exactly. what does that, tell us about what that means. Okay, so it's not the first definition in the dictionary. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, constellations has to do with the relation between things or people. So wherever there's a relationship that exists, we can do a constellation on. So if we start on an individual basis, you can do a constellation on one-on-one -on -one or parts of yourself. So you, and then it can extend out to relationships and, and, and into families or systems. So where it originally found, the founder of it is Bert Hellinger. He's a German psychotherapist and originally he fled from Germany as a young boy with the, with the consent and, and um, acceptance of his parents down to South Africa. And he worked there as a priest. And he worked down there, he was accepted in with the Zulu family, the Zulu people. And he worked with them for 20 years. And through his work and, and adapting into the culture down there, he um, started to understand the reverence for ancestral healing and how we were all connected. And I just recently learned that to say hello in Zulu means we see you. Uh -huh. which is so beautiful because if you ever experience the constellation that's one of the f one of the most important and valuable things that we can say is actually seeing somebody from the whole self of who we are to the whole person that they are and so after he returned back to germany he delved more into eastern philosophy and western psychotherapy studied somatic healing mm. and founded this this constellation process now is this yeah. right after World War II or around yeah, that time? Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. So he's still alive, isn't he? He is. He's. I think it'll be 93 this month. <laughs> yeah, yes, it's pretty fast. So, so, uh, what is the? Tell us about the format of the what the constellation looks like. What it is when you when you get in there because that's kind of interesting. Yeah, it's really interesting. So, um, when you work in a circle. Um, you will have a seeker, so somebody who starts um, that is interested in resolving an issue. So it could be, um, it could be as small as, like I said, uh, a part of yourself. You want to work with a fear that you have, or it could be globally. It could be, a, you know, a larger sphere of, of systemic or um, uh, working through generational issues. And um, so the seeker will have their issue, and I will facilitate the people in the circle to represent members of that person's family or of whatever the issue is that we're working on to come to a resolution. 
And this work is also done one-on-one -on -one as well, and you have uh, different types of representation instead of the people that are in the circle. But the benefit of doing this work in a group setting is that the people that are witnessing and part of the circle also receive healing for their own systems because we are all connected. Yes. So we all receive, and then the people that are representing in the circle, they also receive benefit of healing for their own systems as well. So it's quite a beautiful collective work. I, I've experienced that. I've been in a circle mm -hmm. where I, the, it was all about me, but I've also been in one where I was somebody's father mm -hmm. or I was somebody's brother uh, or somebody's son. And it was very interesting how much I was drawn into the into that role and mm -hmm. how I, I really felt, I did feel that connection with the, the, the other people and mm -hmm. that, was, that was sort of shocking yeah. to me uh, almost that, that it was palpable. <laughs> yeah, so we're working in uh, what Bert coins as the knowing field and it's... The knowing field? The knowing field, okay. the field of, it's like the morphogenic field, the conscious field. And so when you step in with the right intention and the right, um, so, you know, the right intention that's set for the group, you step in as somebody's grandfather or you don't even know what you're stepping in as because mm. I like to do them blind so no one knows what they're doing and it becomes more authentic, more natural so they get out of their head and they're really in the somatic part. And suddenly that person is having a, a sensation or a movement or wants to turn a feeling of maybe love or anger towards somebody else in the circle and that's not theirs, it's the person they're representing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think one of the most interesting things for me is that how this plays into our, uh, our new consciousness that we are all connected. I mean, mm -hmm. we think of quantum consciousness finding that we are instantaneously connected with all parts of the universe mm -hmm. at once. and. I mean, this is something that we think of as new, but in fact, it's not. It's it's a patrimony that the human race has lost. I think we used to we used to do these things, and we've sort of gotten away from it. But now we're getting back into it. Yeah, and so. I think um, you know, our Western culture, we generally don't honor the ancestors. Right. But with new science like epigenetics t telling us that the traumas that exist in our family system, the, the traumas that have been there for generations are still carried in our DNA. Right. Until we can remove that trauma and understand it from a perspective of love and light. Let's take an example of anger. Anger maybe is looked in our, in our society as something wrong, something that's, an, you know, maybe that's not a great emotion to have. But if you look at the origin of it for some systems, I've already seen it where that anger served for survival. Mm -hmm. So that anger continues to flow into the system, but may not be recognized as a gift that that family has because of its origin of survival. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes yeah. sense. <laughs> so um, as far as the, the nuts and bolts of it, uh, how long does it take just the, you come in the morning or in, and uh, it lasts a morning or how long does it last to um, well the process if, if you're one-on-one -on -one, I mean usually an hour to work on a constellation but you can't limit it either so if there's a group process a circle usually I facilitate three three-hour circles generally once uh -huh. a month um, I've done day-long ones as well uh, just depends on the facilitator and the numbers I think as well in the circle okay yeah and uh, do you have anything that, uh, that is in, in particular about uh, the way that you're doing it with the one? I've never participated in a one-on-one -on -one constellation. Can you talk about that or address yeah, that a little bit? Yeah, for sure. There's different ways of doing the one-on-one. -on -one. You can do, um, I have clients that are distant, so that don't necessarily live local or can't actually come to me in person. Mm -hmm. And so um, we can do constellations through visualization process. Um, if I work with children as well, and I use little Playmobil uh, to represent, oh, and they I get see. to pick, you know, we can work on conflicts with their friends or conflicts with family or even situational things. Um, you can use objects in nature. I've done nature constellations where we've picked up rocks and we've moved them around and, and uh, any, anything that is, you know, a representation of those people or those situations. Yeah. Okay, and uh, 
do you find that people, it takes, either people get this or they don't and some people don't want to do it or do you find that pretty much everybody gets into it if they come to, to do it in the first yeah, place? Yeah, generally people, if it's their first time, they sort of just sit and observe, but it depends on the individual. Um, most people are kind of blown away by the end of the process because uh -huh. it's, it's nothing they've ever experienced before. Unless they've done maybe a lot of different modalities, then um, they might have seen it in a different form because there's, there's different types of psychotherapies that work with sculpting and um, gestalt therapies and things like that. I right. don't know a whole lot about those, but um, there is some, some parallels in, in different types of counseling and things like that. Well, Bert Hellinger was a, he was a psychotherapist and he was also a Jesuit, wasn't he? So he had, I think he was a, a priest. He was a he priest, was a yeah. Catholic priest. Yeah. So, so it kind of, it's a mix of different traditions. I mean, you have the, the scientific, the modern scientific yeah. tradition, and you have the old Zulu shamanic tradition. Mm -hmm. But then you also have, it's mixed in sort of with our, I mean, there are references to our sort of Western spirituality, our Judeo-Christian culture, right? Yes, he, definitely. Bert Hellinger really did a, uh, he had to work on this to make it fit with our culture, right? Yeah, the, I think it was really difficult for him um, initially uh, stepping out with this in, in, mm -hmm. um, in the format that, it, but he continued to persevere and, um, and it, it is so well known, especially in Europe. Um, this is the constellation, constellation therapy, it's big in Europe. Huge in Europe, huge in Mexico. Uh. Um, it's growing quite a bit in, in the United States and, and Canada as well. So I think with, you know, with more awareness around, there's more of a desire as well to find out about your ancestry with right. websites like ancestry.ca and people are starting to delve into that, which is creating more of a, an awareness of where we're from and also maybe a change in perspective um, which helps with understanding and that resolution. Right. Unless you're standing in the energy of your grandparents and what the traumas that they've lived, you might not be able to understand that perspective. I have to say that, that when I fir did yeah. my first uh, constellation, I was very skeptical. I was mm -hmm. sitting there like this, but uh, by the time, even that first one, by the time I was out of it, I really learned that this is, uh, this is something that is very useful. It's mm -hmm. If you've been through any kind of therapy that hasn't been successful, trying this can really help. I, because it gives you, a, it's not all about you. It, it brings in other, mm -hmm. so many other factors in a way that's not the same. <laughs> it mm -hmm. just, it really is different. So I, I'd have to say that uh, I thought that it, it's something that people who are frustrated with where they are would, mm -hmm. could really benefit from trying this because it can give you a totally different, it can snap you into a different place very quickly. Yes, definitely. Yeah. It's you, we live our lives based on our perspective of where we're at and what we see. But when you witness it from a different angle, your, your paradigm shifts, your, your eyes open up and you're like, oh, I didn't realize that my mother had such challenges when she was a child. I have so much compassion for her now because you might not have seen it until you see it in this sort of format or what lies behind somebody, you know? Yeah. Well, thank you very much. We're out of time, Rochelle, but right. that was really fascinating. And I'm, I thank you so much for coming onto the show and telling us about this. And thank you for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. <laughs>
And if before, you know, you go to a restaurant and the first thing they do is give you a glass of ice water and you start drinking it, what does that do to your digestive system just before it has to go to work digesting the food that you're about to eat? So we should all keep that in mind. I think if people do it, you will find that just that one change of cutting out cold foods um, will have an impact for the better on your health. That's cold energy. Well, I've been trying to follow that advice now for a couple of years since I went to see your Chinese medical practitioner, and I learned a lot from her, actually. And one of the things that I've done uh, consistently, I used to eat a lot of raw vegetables and salads, and I just can't handle it anymore. And she told me, I just, you know, you, once you hit a certain age, you have to start cooking your vegetables. So I don't eat cooked salad, but I do, I don't eat raw vegetables anymore, and it, it do, I do feel better. It's hard on my system to digest raw vegetables. Yeah. So I think that has something to do with it. I'm not sure exactly, but they're, they're warm vegetables instead of cold. Yeah, yeah. And the same thing with smoothies. Or, you know, a lot of, a lot of children are given uh, cereal and cold milk to start, to start the day off, a cold breakfast. Well, if we just warm things up, you know, and plus they taste great. Next, next on the agenda. I'm making up the agenda as we How about uh, proportional representation? What have you <coughs> been hearing about uh, how that's doing as so far as people is, getting their votes in? Yeah, so today is the third. Uh, this will start to show about a week from now. So everything will have been finished. The count may have already have taken place by the time anybody sees this. So I have no idea what the end result is going to be. I think that proportional representation is more democratic. I think it will make great and positive changes in our society if we can get it. I hope we do. Okay, what else, Jack? How about peace and quiet and the corporate industrial state? Yeah. Oh, Where do we go to that? Huge. Uh, well, we, were, we, we both like peace and quiet. I mean, we've been to places where we have peace and quiet, and it's definitely missing in our modern life to some extent, right? So how yeah. do we get it? Traveling out to the outside the city? We shouldn't have to, you know. And the cities should be built uh, because people need peace and quiet. You know, when you go into peace and quiet, you, as I did really for the first time in my life just a few years ago, um, you see that this is really the speed at which the real world works and it's very, very slow, right? Yes. And plus it's pleasant you can think well what's your favorite uh, quiet place in Victoria uh, I'll tell you one which is it's a uh, secret <laughs> you know really I'll tell you one which is uh, government house on oh, Rockland yes. Avenue yeah I mean it, it's in the middle of the city and sometimes you know there's somebody blowing leaves around there or just the crazy stuff do we really need leaf blowers in this society of ours? Or cutting the grass, you know, with a, a lawnmower that disturbs the entire neighborhood? Or, you know, there'll be a, once there was a tractor working on the street near Government House on Rockland, and every time it backed up, beep, 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 beep. I mean, really, do we really need this? <laughs> but it's a beautiful park, it's a beautiful garden, it's a very, very pleasant spot. Government House, uh, it's, it's nice in the winter, it's even nicer in the summer. There are lots of beautiful places around here. I, I've been shocked <laughs> by how beautiful things are. I mean, there's so many gardens. I have a couple of uh, gardens that I like to go to. One is called the Spring Ridge Commons, and it's just a neighborhood garden that's owned by the Victoria High School. And it's in my neighborhood in Fernwood, near Caledonia and Chambers. And it's just a magic little place that's uh, not like anything <laughs> right around there. And then there's a, there's a garden in Uvic, that I particularly like. I can't remember yes. what the name of it is, but it's just, it's a really beautiful little garden. I know the place you mean. It is a beautiful garden. And yeah. Beacon Hill Park can be Beacon nice. Hill Park, yeah, yeah, yeah certain yeah. areas. But we, I think it's something we need more of. We need more peace and quiet in our lives. And uh, I think, I think everybody would benefit from that. Um, it would be nice to have a street, you know, one street going, let's say, north from, from James Bay out of town that was, uh, I mean, wouldn't it be nice to have one, it was just a walkway, right? No cars, um, maybe tall grasses planted, 
right? So there'd be really, you'd, you'd lose a bit of the sound of the city, and you could have a pleasant walk through a beautiful thing. Um, I think we're headed for that, though. I, I, was uh -huh. reading a, I was reading a story about, I think we might have talked about this once, uh, in South Korea, the car culture is relatively new because they just didn't, it didn't develop there. And uh, they've already gone through a cycle of creating these huge highways within the city and then tearing those down because people don't like them and they daylighted a river that used to be covered up by some of these roads. I think it's in Seoul, South Korea. And I think that this is a trend that we're going to see. I've heard of this happening in Europe. People are reclaiming these natural places, the magic places, the places where you know nature comes forth and it not touched. So people are, after living in cities for this long, are realizing that that's something that we've given away per perhaps too easily. I know walking down the street here, you can hardly talk anymore. The, it's so loud. Yeah. When, yeah. So well, we've just kind of sort of accepted that, but really. Um, but it would be right. It would be great to have some streets that are just green. You yeah. know, like you walk down the street and there's a stream. Oh, that would be beautiful, yeah, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be nice? And you know, if the whole world slowed down a little bit and people could work less hard and, uh, and have more of the lives maybe that we wanted instead of racing around to work for the boss. Uh, well, let's keep a lookout for that because there are people, uh, we, we walked around with some people who were daylighting the Rock Creek uh, that goes from uh, place in Fernwood down to Rock Bay, isn't that what it's called? Rock. Uh, the, the street, the streets have completely covered up this one, and then there's one in in Oak Bay that's being daylighted yes, gradually. Yes, yes. What is the name of that? I can't Boker? remember. Boker is it Boker? Yeah, Boker. Creek? Boker. Boker Creek. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so that one, you know, people are. The, the thing about this is, though, this doesn't make the news. I, I mean, it's not huge. It may be a feature or something, but right. you know, are people really aware of it? I, that's what I. I think we, you know, we can make. Uh, make some little videos or something that would show what, what people have as a vision for the future because it's not all concrete and steel. I think we're overwhelmed by concrete and steel now in Victoria, just walking around downtown and seeing all the new structures that are going up. So I would yeah, welcome I, that. I'd like to get a vision for a greener uh, Victoria instead of a more built up Victoria. Yes, and we can definitely, definitely, definitely make big strides. There is no shortage of, I mean, we could stop building downtown right now, we've, I, you know, and just take, a, just take a look as you walk up Government or Douglas uh, from downtown to Mayfair Mall. It's all one story, um, uh, light industrial and retail. I mean, you could put up large amounts of housing in, in that area and run, run trains down one street, you know, it would be and if you go between Mayfair Mall and Uptown Mall, it's all parking lots and one-story um, uh, retail, basically. And if you come out of the front door of Saanich City Hall, where this homeless encampment was recently, and it, it, it was used by the power structure to create so much division in our community, so much hate was per permeated towards, towards the homeless people. But right across from Santa City Hall, there are three hectares uh, in two malls that are all parking lot and hmm. one story uh, retail, you know. So why not have that as five or six or ten story with the retail that's there now just as the first story? You wouldn't have to go into neighborhoods. You could build a thousand units of housing right there in a very, very nice setting. <coughs> you know, it's... it's uh, we, we, we can do much better. All right, what's next? What's Another four next? minutes or so. Okay. Would it, would it help us, would it help Victoria and BC and Canada to have an independent media that was separate of corporate control and could say something that we're not allowed to see in the corporate media? For example, CBC, CTV, Global, all the radio stations and all the newspapers. Would that be of benefit to the people of Canada? I think yes. 
I think it would be great. Uh, I just don't know how it happens. And, you know, it's always a question of money. <coughs> and I've got the solution. Yeah. I read this years ago in a book. It was an idea put forward by an American economist. We could have, I think, an independent media that would save us billions of dollars at a cost of, I would say, $6 million a year. Right? So the government creates a fund of $6 million, $5 million a year with $1 million to administer, which is about a dollar. 20 or something per people of per person in BC and uh, but the government doesn't control where the money goes that's the important thing people vote so if you have 200,000 votes and uh, it's five million dollar fund then each vote is worth $25 and if something like for example common ground the magazine common ground got 2,000 votes that would be $50,000 which isn't a lot of money but for a publication like Common Ground, it's a huge amount of money, right? So they could expand and get the message out, and people could start to hear the truth, which is, in the corporate media, we only hear the corporate truth. But if right. we had a bigger independent media, we could hear other truth. And, for example, we would not, I think, if we had a, an independent media, we would never have signed, I think it's $50 billion worth of contracts to purchase electricity that we don't need from the corporate sector. And we're locked into that now. We're, we're talking $50 billion that nobody knows about because the media never talks about it, but an independent media would. So these things would have less chance of being done to us if we knew what was going on. Yeah, that requires, that requires discipline on, on the part of voters to educate themselves and not just accept what's fed to us. So I think we're seeing that transition though. A lot of people are uh, giving up their TVs and moving towards the internet. I think we're in such a uh, place of transition right now, it's really hard to see where it's going to go. But I know, uh, you know, I, I don't depend on, I never watch TV anymore. I just watch, on, watch things on the internet. I watch, I go to uh, several sites for my news and I watch things on YouTube. I, I find that that's a uh, a good way for me to get things because it's unfiltered. I can get what I want and I can, I don't have it, it's not chewed up for me. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that's, that's great and important, but also a nation sort of has a national media which tells a story that, you know, the general public, including myself, believe is, is what's happening. But as I found out after many, many years of believing, it's not really what was happening. Well, I'm certainly, I mean, I'm working in this area, so I'm certainly willing to help make that happen. So let's keep working on it and see if we can make it happen. Yeah. Independent media. Independent media. Uh, thank you very much for watching this segment of Citizens Forum, and uh, see you in a few weeks.